Yeah, my name is Dave Binninger. I'm the research tree fruit entomologist based down by Gettysburg. And I'm going to talk today about some good news. I probably started working with bees in about 2008. Uh, and back then, there were, everybody, you go to the ESA meetings, entomology meetings, and be like 200 talks on honeybees, a couple on bumblebees, and maybe one or two on solitary bees. That's completely switched to where everybody's starting to realize those wild bees were out there doing something for a long time, and nobody took notice of them. This was actually a shed. These are my osmia nests in there back in the wooded site. Um, we didn't have much of a budget back then. It's gotten a lot better. <laughs> for those of us that have been preaching to the choir for a long time about wild bees, we're finally being heard and we're finally relevant. So the reason I like these guys is because of the, the diversity. <laughs> uh, that shows you the big bee and the littlest bee in, in around this area. And I'll pose the question to, to kids that come in or, or, or extension people. What do you think is more diversity, bees or fish? And there's only 19,000 species of fish, saltwater, and freshwater in the world, but 22,000 kinds of bees. Which sounds like a lot, but I used to work on parasitic hymenoptera, or you know, hundreds of thousands per family, so at least these are named, and we can figure out what they do for the most part. Like I said, most of my career has actually been working on pesticides to control the pests, but I've, a large part of my career has been looking at reduced risk pesticides to develop these selective insecticides that were safer to people. But basically what we've been trying to do is get away from the broad spectrum insecticides that will get tanked that you kill everybody for miles around. Well, Food Quality Protection App came in and says, those things are too toxic to people. Let's start doing reduced risk pesticides, of which neonics were part of it. And they're a lot safer to people. And then the ultimate is a pheromone mating disruption where you don't actually kill the thing, you just get them really frustrated because they can't find the female. And I, being a taxonomist, I like to look at all the different predators and parasitoids that are out there uh, that help control a lot of our secondary pests. We, get, we have no tolerance for things like collie moth in your apple. You don't want half of a collie moth in your apple because you know where the other half went. <laughs> so there are certain pests we call secondary pests, like aphids and scale insects and things like that that we can control if we don't take away their biological control. And even more important are these parasitoids, which help regulate populations in, a, in an unsprayed orchard. You don't see a whole lot of these in the past in orchards because most pesticides wiped them out. And a large part of my career has been documenting which of these guys are starting to come back. And it wasn't a big uh, step to make the step from conserving beneficial insects to conserving bees. To me, it was just another way of conserving a good bug to give those ecosystem services. And for all my not liking honeybees, they are very important in tree fruit. The estimated value for tree fruits is about $4 billion, so for just for honeybees. And there's some advantages of honeybees. You put them in a box, basically you stop spraying. Apple bloom is only about seven to 10 days long. You put the honeybees in the hive, you stop spraying, you come back, take the honeybees out, move them away, and then you can start spraying again. When you rely on wild bees, they're out there constantly. So you have to worry about those early season sprays, getting in the nectar and pollen, whether it's insecticides or fungicides. And then the hardest thing has been, what is petal fall? Growers, when they have honeybees, petal falls when you take those honeybee hives out. It could be 20% of the bloom is still left. When you're relying on wild bees, as we're doing more and more, you've got to be really selective with that petal fall spray because you can wipe out everybody. And most of the pollinators for tree fruit are actually univoltine, one generation. So you wipe them out, there's nobody next year. Uh, and I'll show you, it's more of a, 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 that the orchards are serving as a sink for pollinators coming in from the landscape in Pennsylvania. So everybody knows all the problems with the honeybees, and they're growing almonds in the desert. Um, honeybees, for us, in, if we have an early season of apples, we have to get all those honeybee hives back out of the almonds in time for the apple bloom. And the costs have gone quite, quite a bit higher too. So we kind of started not having a steady source of honeybees for apples in the spring. And a lot of times they were what they call package bees that didn't have much strength at all anyways. But we all know there's a lot, multiple factors that are in there. I deal with a lot of trying to minimize the pesticide impacts, but all these other things like putting them on a semi and shipping them from Pennsylvania to California, uh, it's a pretty stressful thing for them to do. So Marion Fraser did a survey, and we basically did these time counts in apple orchards back in 1998, well before colony collapse disorder. And there used to be this kind of rule of thumb that you needed about two to three bees per two minute count to have enough pollinators, and enough honeybees back then to get adequate pollination. But we came back 10 years later into some of those same orchards, and we found the numbers had gone way down, uh, up to like a six fold decline in there. And it was the same orchards, same trees, and it was partially because the hives were getting weaker and partially because the, they were getting so expensive the, the apple growers were starting to come back, cut back on them. 
So like a lot of other people, when colony collapse disorder came along, we started looking at alternative pollinators, all these wild bees that were probably doing some of the job already. And I highly recommend this book, anything with Xerces. They've been working with bee conservation for decades. And there's a lot of precedents for different crops where in the past they did all the pollination instead of the honeybees. And there's a lot of diversity, mostly in the East Coast where we've got complex landscapes where there's a lot of places for them to nest and feed on something other than that monoculture crop and to kind of get away from the pesticides. So it was part of this ICP program. We all started looking at what can be done if the worst case scenario, honeybees disappear? Can we get by with the wild pollinators? The one thing that was different in our crop in the ICP was that most people were looking at yields. Almonds, you're looking at yields. Blueberries is mostly about yields. In tree fruit, you're not looking at yield, you're looking at fruit quality and size. You can't sell a whole bunch of little marble-sized apples. They won't even buy those for juice. So out of all those flowers that are out there at bloom, you only need two to 5% of those to set and have fruit and apples to have a full crop. Anything else, you're gonna have to spray chemically to thin them off. Otherwise, you'll have too small a fruit that you can't sell. Same thing with peaches, a little bit higher, but only five to 8% of those. So the pollination requirements are not that high for uh, our tree fruit in the east here. If we can just get that amount, we're good, and we don't have to pay extra. And peaches actually have to pay for labor to hand thin those, so you have one peach every four to six inches of branch. And the biggest cost for, for fruit growers is actually labor. We probably had more than we needed with all these honeybee eyes out there as well. <laughs> now, if you're looking at yield, like we look at cherries, you need at least 80% of those uh, blossoms to set. So whereas we have a lot of peach growers and apple growers I'll talk about in a second that don't use honeybees, we always put honeybees out there in the cherries because it's all about yield. And we have a really good example of how wild bees have been doing it for a long time in that uh, we have peaches. We have about 4,000 acres of peaches in Pennsylvania. Peaches are wind pollinated. They don't need bees. But in anybody that thought they needed bees, they thought, well, it's the feral honeybees. Well, colony collapse has sort of killed all the wild honeybees out there. And growers have not been using the honeybees in peaches for 50 years. We also had a number of fruit growers that uh, had not used honeybees in apple orchards, like 1,000 acres at a time for over 30 years. So we had some good examples that it was possible. So with that in mind, I started looking at who's doing the job. I've gotten over 260 bees species in and around orchards sometime during the year. We're getting a, quite a bit of a diversity. And I'm also trying to set a baseline as to whether or not reducing pesticides is actually increasing bee diversity and abundance in these orchards as we get away from some of the practices we know that were harmful to bees. And of these, it's nice to have redundancy, you know. I mean, we have 50 to 60 species that are out there every year. So one year they're really super abundant, next year they may be gone. Small bees don't forage very far from the edge of the orchards, bigger bees do. And they can kind of take over, it's kind of ecosystem functioning, you know, that they can compensate for the, the natural cycles in certain populations. So I'll talk a lot about Osmi cornifrons, which is the Japanese orchard bee, but to me it's just one of 50 or 60 species that are out there doing the job. We kind of have some interesting, uh, you know, general keys for the different bees that are out there. But if you look at page nine on this, you'll see a very nice a graph that we have that shows basically the phenology of tree fruits. You start out with apricots, you go to plums, peaches, cherries, and then you end up with apples. And the best bee populations are always in the diversified farms that have all of these crops because they've got a smorgasbord to feed on for four to five weeks. If you're only an apple farm, you've only got seven to 10 days of bloom, and then you gotta find something else to eat. So we've got a nice situation here, and we've got an idea what other trees to plant to help supplement that if you're only growing apples. And another reason we can buy with mostly wild bees is this Japanese orchard bee was introduced by USDA ARS about uh, the late 80s. And it's been shown that one of these Japanese orchard bees females will set 2,500 apple blossoms in a day. The honeybees kind of gets out of bed late and it's not that terribly efficient because it's wetted down the pollen and only sets 50. And a Japanese orchard bee having that big hairy scope out there that transfers 100 times more pollen will do it in a single visit, but a honeybee has to go to that same flower twice. So on a B2B basis, they're like 80 to 100 times more efficient. And we've also done some work in cherries to show that we can double the yield of cherries because they're such uh, efficient pollinators over honeybees. Blue orchard bee, I get a lot of grief. Why aren't you working with a native bee? It's like, well, anybody know what the only native tree fruit crop is in the US? pawpaw, which is fly pollinated. So if you wanna get really good uh, pawpaw pollination, hang dead fish 
from the branches and then all the flies will come in and pollinate it. So Osmia in general are very well adapted to rosacea, but they're really well adapted for the rosacea crops. And in the East Coast, the blue orchard bee is a different subspecies here. It doesn't do nearly as well. And these guys all nest in pre-existing holes uh, for, that were made by beetles and dead trees and stuff. And Osmia cornfrons, a Japanese orchard bee, will nest in any hole from five millimeters up to 12. But the blue orchard bee is really picky. It only wants eight millimeters. And I think it's just a little more adaptable to the local habitat. These guys will also fly out there earlier in the morning. They'll go out in a light rain. There's a lot of advantages to some of these bees. And, and this is, I raise 25, 30,000 of these Japanese orchard bees every year in these nest containers. They're very efficient, but they only fly about, a, about 40, 50 yards, which is okay in apple orchards because if you fly into your neighbor's orchard and he has fire blight, which is the disease that kills the apples, they will bring it back to your orchard. A bee that doesn't fly that far is not a bad thing. And especially if the neighbor is using really nasty pesticides, they're not gonna bring it back into your orchard as well. And this is some of the work we did, just real, just show you where we marked the bees and we actually went back to the same trees and we showed we could double the yield of the cherries uh, in orchards without honeybees. There's a bunch of formulas talking about how far they forage, but if you put a Japanese orchard bee nest in the middle of a cherry orchard, it doesn't need to fly very far. It can fly hundreds of yards away, but if it's got all the food it wants, it only flies about 40 or 50 meters. So basically we wanted to know if we were gonna replace the honeybees, how many of these hives do we need? We only need 250 females to replace 10, 12,000 honeybees, but we need one of these every acre. And it's surprising how many insects are out there that want to either eat the bee or steal the bee's pollen or you know, kill the bee's larvae and then eat the pollen. Uh, there's a lot of parasites out there. So wild bees come with their own problems too. Like these are Japanese orchard bees. They're covered with these mites to the point that they can't even fly. If you sing, use the same nest materials and they will get in there and they will transfer it from cell to cell and it'll eat all the pollen before the, the bee larvae can eat it. So there's some management practices we've had to do with osmia as well. Um, the pesticide impacts being one of them. Other people are thinking about osmia too as a test subject. The thing is osmia doesn't really sting much. They only lay about 30 eggs, but they started to raise them in Italy where people with allergies to honeybees, uh, the kids and stuff like that, they can't have honeybees there. Osmia don't fly far. They're really hard to get you to sting. Uh, they're really safe to, to use in situations like that. And for crops that have really show, low sugar content like uh, Asian pears and pears, where honeybees will go to anything but them, the, the Japanese orchard bees probably have a very good fit commercially because they, don't, they just want the pollen. Okay, a lot of the stuff I do with xeraces, I mean, this is basically what you need for any bees that are out there. Food, hopefully you got more food than just on those almond trees for 10 days. Nest sites, that usually comes from the outside. We're not getting a lot of bees nesting in the orchard, still too many pesticides even though we've cut back. And protection from farm, harmful farm practices. So the best diversified fruit farm that has apricots, plums, cherries, and like that, that's where we see the most diversity. If you're just raising apples, you're not gonna get quite the diversity, unless you have a lot of good habitat for them to fly into from the edges. And like where I grew up in the Midwest, where you don't see a tree for miles and miles. If you have a habitat like this, and no place for them to nest, no alternative food, you better be using honeybees. But we have a very good situation in Pennsylvania where our orchards are relatively small on the sides of mountains, uh, there's a picture down there by the station uh, to where we've got you know, plenty of habitat for them to fly in. If you look at Adams County, which is actually the most apple acreage in all of the United States, including West Coast, uh, we have 22,000 acres of apples in Pennsylvania and about 8% are in Adams County. And 56% of it is forest because they raise them on the side of mountains, a south facing slope, whereas in Michigan, New York, they raise them next to the lakes for frost protection. We raise them up high and we raise them small and if you look at a typical orchard, there's all these nice fence rows and woods all surrounding them that they can't put in anything else because it's really steep. And we have this really poster child kind of, as, as Zirsi says, situation for complex habitat where there's a lot of alternative food and nesting habitats. So we're really well set up. There's some positive news here that we've actually got a really good situation that we do not want to go away. So we started looking at different zones because we were worried the further you away from the woods, where's the breaking point to where you can't rely on the wild pollinators? Remember, some of them are really small, don't fly very far. But the proof is when we get harvest, we get a, a marketable crop with a good yield, enough seeds. Apples typically have 10 seeds inside of them. 
the thought was that you had to have all 10 seeds to get a really nice, well-shaped apple, but we're finding certain varieties like Honeycrisp can get by with no seeds or only one seed. It all depends on the fruit load and the chemical thinning as to whether or not they stick around there. So it's a little bit more of a complex issue. But basically we were testing out to 200 meters, which is about the furthest distance you can get for most of ours. And you see here with the honeybee, you know, it basically doesn't matter to them. If you put all 22,000 acres in a big circle in Pennsylvania of apples, put a honeybee in a hive, you could be assured that it was not foraging outside of that orchard. They fly that far. Whereas the, and bumblebees are not quite as far, but there's a lot of them and they fly a fairly good distance. It's the solitary bees I was worried about. As we got to 200 meters, you definitely see a decline in the numbers. But is the decline enough so that we're not meeting that two to 5% out there at 200 meters? But in general, we really didn't see too much of a, a real response. You know, out to 200 meters, we got enough fruit or with, a, with enough seeds, they've had a commercial crop. And the guys have been doing this for 30 years and on thousands of acres, we're right. They could get by without the honeybees. So out, we're pretty sure at this point, out to 200 meters, which is most of the orchards, as long as you've got good habitat around there, you can get by without the honeybees on apples and, cher or apples and peaches, not cherries. And the other thing we got out of this is, this is the biggest block I know around in Pennsylvania. It's a 100 acre block. <coughs> Instead of putting um, 200 honeybee eyes out here, well, look at the gaps where the wild bees can't get. You can put your honeybees eyes a little more strategic strategically here so that the wild bees are covering the edges, but you're putting your honeybee eyes in a better place. The other thing is this is where your pollination gaps are if it's more than 200 meters. Maybe this is where you should put your pollinator strips in your habitat. So the upshot of this after about 10 years is that most of our apple growers in Pennsylvania and New York no longer use honeybees. We're relying on the wild bees. And at $125 per hive and two hives per acre, a grower with 100 acres is saving about $20,000 a year. The bottom line is they're also businessmen. So we had to show them that there was an economic benefit to this. So again, low pollination requirements compared to some of the other crops we were looking at yield. We finally got smart and went to something a little more high tech, but we put in about 300 acres total, and this makes really good sense where you've got those gaps where there's no fence rows or woodlots around there to give them nesting sites and, and additional food. We had a lot of growers interested. We found out basically the stuff that was being planted in most pollinator strips really didn't help the tree fruit much because they bloom too late. They bloom after apple bloom. It helps things like bumblebees that have multiple generations, but those univoltine species, they could care less. But we came up with these NRCS recommendations for Pennsylvania, both for cover crop alternative species, and there's a list of them. And also we're going more toward pollinator hedgerows, woody plants that bloom early, like red maples and things like that. They're more useful. So most of our Pennsylvania growers are really not using honeybees, at least in apples. They don't have that requirement. They never use that in peaches. Uh, you know, maintaining the fence rows, the efforts we're doing with NRCS at this point are paying growers to not take out that fence row, not take out that woodlot, and realize there's a value to it, and hopefully work together some models with the, that'll actually put a value on that. And then consider bees with pesticides, because if you're relying on wild bees, you've got to be a lot more concerned than, the, is the box in the orchard or out of the orchard? And a lot of different funding agencies just uh, wanted to put a plug in for Xerces. We do a lot of work with them. They've been around forever. They are the one-stop shopping guide for most of the regional requirements. You go to their website, you'll find all these resources are available. They're also embedded within NRCS. And those of you who are not familiar with NRCS, I joke with farmers that they put their money where my mouth is. This basically pays for 80% of the perceived costs if I work with them. I don't get any money out of it, but it's a way to implement really good ideas and get it out there. And uh, they're really in there for anything that will have an environment, save pesticides, environmental concerns. And Xerces has a whole series of guides that most of them are available online free as PDFs. A very good book as well, which I didn't find my copy of. I would highly recommend getting to the Xerces websites. And they have these regional plant lists that are basically for each of the regions. Very, very useful.